get ready because this next video is going to weigh heavily on your mind. It's going to tip the balance between baking and baffling. You might even say that it measures up to your wildest dreams. All right, I'm officially out of scale puns. We are making a scale cake, folks, a kitchen scale cake. Hey there, I'm April, and this is the April Julian Cakes channel. The fact that you're still here after that barrage of horrible puns means a lot. So, thanks a ton. Okay, I promise, I'm done now, I'm done. This video is the grand finale of my behind the scenes series chronicling my Is It Cake collaboration with fellow YouTuber Lori from The Icing Artist. April, um, hyper realistic queen right here, and she did all the cake and all the decor, so I literally know nothing, and I'm ready for round one. If you've been following along, you've witnessed all my cakey creations inspired by everything from fashion to fast food, gardening to baking ingredients. And now in our vintage themed showdown, behold the piece de resistance, a cake inspired by a treasure found at the treasure trove that is Value Village, a 70s Waymaster kitchen scale. This episode is honestly an ode to my love of templates. I would not have even attempted this cake without them. As you can see, this scale is all about sharp geometry. You've got right angles, sharp angles, weird angles. Unlike fruit, which is natural, has natural imperfections, this is all very precise. And the only way I can replicate that is by having my templates there as a blueprint for success. There's little room for error here, so I really need to rely on them heavily. I start by taking parchment paper and, you know, tracing each and every surface of this scale to form my template. There's quite a few pieces in the end, so I make sure to label everything really carefully so I know exactly how to put this jigsaw puzzle back together when I assemble the cake. With those templates, I've got my red velvet white chocolate ganache cake all carved and ready, then I crumb coat it and frost it with more chocolate ganache. Now it's on to the star of this show, my chocolate. This cake is basically a big, beautiful cake-filled chocolate bar. I decide to use chocolate over, say, fondant or gum paste for this cake because I know that if chocolate is tempered well, you can get really thin pieces that are very sturdy and shiny and essentially look like plastic. The only thing is I'm making this cake during a heat wave and in the schoolyard of confection, chocolate and heat do not always play nice. So I'm taking a pretty big gamble here. For the exterior of my cake, I'm using my favorite Calvo white chocolate calettes, and I'm going for sort of the general color here, this retro color theme, but I'm not gonna match it exactly color-wise. These are not gonna be sitting next to each other. So for the top, I keep the chocolate its natural ivory color. For the bottom, I tint it to this beautiful light tangerine. I'm using oil-based colors from Color Mill. You cannot use a water-based color here, like gel colors. That is going to seize your chocolate a big no-no when trying to temper chocolate. This is not going to look like nice smooth plastic if you use that. I pop my chocolate calettes into the microwave and once it's reached the proper finishing temperature, I know we're good to start pouring it onto the acetate sheets to set up. By the way, if you'd like a separate tutorial on how to temper white chocolate, let me know in the comments. Ask and you shall receive. I use these metal ganache rulers to size the white chocolate pieces that form the top part of this cake. They need to be a little bit thicker than the orange pieces and these rulers are going to help me do that. Once they've firmed up a bit, I use my precision cutting tool, a surgeon's number 11 scalpel, to cut the pieces to the size of my handy dandy templates. Yes, it's a real surgeon's scalpel, obviously never used in any kind of surgical procedures that do not involve cake. I use my T-square to make sure that any right angles on this cake are exactly that. For my tangerine chocolate, 
I basically take my chocolate and spread it out onto acetate using a large offset metal spatula. I want to create a thin sheet of chocolate that is just large enough to cut out all my template pieces. Once again, I wait for that sheet of chocolate to firm up a bit before I put my templates on them and score out the size of each of my pieces with a scalpel. And then I leave those to just fully crystallize before I start popping them out to assemble the cake. I have all my chocolate puzzle pieces now, so I start to put this puppy together. I start by attaching the back, the sides, and the top sections of the scale directly to the cake. Then I add a small piece of black fondant to conceal the top of the cake that's exposed. And then I take a small piping bag filled with melted chocolate to fill in the gaps where the panels meet. I want to make this black square of fondant look like an aged piece of galvanized steel. To do that, I take a bit of silver shimmer and dust it all over that black piece. I don't worry too much about making this perfect or the lumps and bumps because you're barely going to see this once all the other chocolate pieces are on top of it. Little did I know that I actually made a huge error at this point. I'm just sort of in ignorant bliss thinking things are looking really great, but more on that later. Now it's time to make that little calibration knob here. I use a small piece of light gray gum paste and roll it into a sausage shape. Then I take my scalpel and sort of make periodic indentations to mimic that grippy sort of ridge that's all around the knob. And so here we've arrived at my very first make it to fake it tip of this video. These are the details that I think bring a cake to hyper-realistic heights. Now, this cake is going to eventually be sitting next to other real vintage decoy items. So if I can't make this thing look old, I'm sunk. If you look at the knob, this calibration knob, it's not a solid color. The metal has oxidized over time. So I mimic this effect by dry brushing my edible silver paint over the sides of that knob. And since the brush isn't loaded with paint, the silver doesn't go into those grooves we've made so carefully with our scalpel. And that really gives it that same aged effect. I actually use this dry brush technique a lot on many different types of cakes and textures and it works a charm. For this front face plate, I want all the seams to be pretty much invisible. So my plan is to melt the edges of the chocolate panels to act as the glue that will stick them all together. I set up a large metal scraper sitting on top of a small ceramic bowl, and then I use my blowtorch to warm a small section of the metal. You can see in this particular shot how shiny and beautiful that chocolate looks. It really resembles plastic, and I just love how that tempering worked and that gamble paid off. I carefully take the first side piece and place it on the warmed metal just long enough to melt it slightly. And then I attach it to the face plate. It's super important that all the pieces of this front face plate are perfectly perpendicular. Otherwise, this is going to look totally wonky. By the way, wonky is a real cake decorating term, okay? Just like Tilt's cake. Anyway, no one wants a wonky cake. So I've got two triangle squares next to my chocolate pieces to help support them as they set up. These triangle squares are actually carpenter tools Tools, and I use them quite a lot to make sure I have nice right angles on my cakes. You wouldn't believe how many of my cake decorating tools are actually from the hardware store. I've got my piping bag of chocolate again and start attaching this front face plate to the rest of the cake. It's precisely at this point when I realize I've made a very regrettable error. See, these side pieces, they're supposed to be as tall as this front face plate. But when I was attaching them earlier, I thought they were supposed to be as tall as the cake. So I cut them down to size. It wasn't until I actually attached the front piece that I realized I cut them too short. Mm. I was a fool. I'm a fool. An April Fool to be exact, I should never have questioned my templates. You can see in this shot, I ended up adding a few pieces to extend the sides before adding the top of the faceplate. I recovered, but lesson learned. Always trust the templates. They're always right. So I assembled the white part of the scale in the exact same way I did the front faceplate, melting the edges of the two side pieces and attaching them at right angles to the back. And then I melt the bottom of this whole bracket and attach it to the top of the cake. It's all fitting in so beautifully like a jigsaw puzzle. See, this is what happens when you take the time to make good templates and you follow them. I add this little square piece to the top and now we're on to aging this bad boy. 
For my second make it to fake it technique, I take brown and gray petal dust and dust all over the cake to replicate dirt and dust and I put it wherever I think it would naturally accumulate over the years. It might seem like tempering the chocolate to create that beautiful plastic shine only to cover it up in like a dusty dirty powder is a big waste of time but seeing that little bit of shine peek through here and there is the total fake out here. That is, this look like plastic. That yeah. looks so realistic. This is what adds authenticity to this, that it was once a shiny plastic object that's aged over the years. Okay, we are on to the final details. I take this front picture with all the measurements on it, and then I scan it with my computer and print it out as an edible image. I attach this to the front face plate with some edible glue and then trim it down to size. Then I take those same petal dusts I use to sort of make the rest of the cake dirty, and I dust that all over the image to make it look like it's had some water damage and dirt accumulation over the years. And now for my absolute favorite detail of this cake. I've actually taken the top and scanned this Value Village price tag. This scale really was $4.99 and it was worth every penny as it was the absolute perfect muse for this cake. Also, this thing actually measures accurately and when I looked it up on eBay, I think it was going for like 20 bucks. So I actually made a profit here. The final little jewel of this piece is of course the needle. Since this thing is from the 70s or at least I think it is, I decided to go for the classic avocado green and orange combo. So I tint my gum paste to the perfect retro shade and I cut it out using what else? but a template of the real needle. After it dried hard, I attach it to the front of the cake with a tiny little dot of melted chocolate. And for my final make it to fake it detail, I decide to attach the needle just slightly off the zero mark, just like the real scale. Because of course, over the years, this thing has become uncalibrated and it's off the mark. The perfection is in the imperfection, folks. And there you have it, folks, a vintage kitchen scale cake. What do you think? Do you think you would have been able to find this cake in a lineup of other vintage decoys? Let me know in the comments. And if you want to see if I successfully duped the icing artist, check out the video which I've linked below alongside links to the other BTS videos of the cakes I made in this series. And as always, if you liked this video and the others in my series, if you want to see more from me, please do hit the like and subscribe button. It would help me out a ton. Thank you so much for watching and until we kick again, 